Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, great to be with you on BronxNet's The Bronx Buzz. This is the program where we talk to journalists and videographers and writers, and one of the sections tonight will be about filmmakers and uh, anybody really doing media and reporting on uh, the borough of the Bronx. And um, it gives you some insight into what they're talking about, what they're thinking about, what they're writing about, et cetera, et cetera. I am uh, beyond thrilled to have back on the program and she's somewhere down in Lower Manhattan, I understand, is my buddy Sadef Ali Kali, who is with City Limits. Nice to have you with us. Hi, Gary. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm good. I, we caught you uh, kind of before you're going to a hearing downtown. Why don't you fill us in as to what's happening? And then we can look ahead into City Limits and find out what you'll be writing about. Well, I'm going to be covering the Treader Revision Commission hearing this evening, and they uh, have like some recommendations that they put out in a preliminary report earlier in April, and um, it's about changing the way New York City elections uh, will allow for a winner to who gets like a small share of the vote. Um, there's the cha there could be possible changes to the way the Civilian Complaint Review Board will happen. And um, we could we could also see uh, more authority for the public advocates role, the borough president's role. Um, mm. And uh, there's uh, uh, there's more transparency yeah, the, for the city's budget. So there's, yeah, there's a, a whole slew of things. Um, yeah. Do you have a sense that like like where is this in the process? Uh, in other words, this, well, this is, is very uh, well, it's not super early on, but by, midway, by July, they'll have a final report. So this is right in the middle of it. Right. Um, and we're expecting uh, and we're hoping uh, housing and tenant advocates are pushing for a lot of land use and planning changes. And there are several several groups, uh, advocacy groups across the city pu pushing for their um, own ideas about equity and affordability in this city. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see if the, those come through. I'm, I'm smiling because what it sounds like is you're going to have a, a, a classic New York City political roundup tonight. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, 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 I'm thrilled that you're going to be there and not me. I'm sure it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun to cover. Um, do you have any predictions or a sense of uh, you know, what might happen, or at this point, it's really, let's just Today watch. is a public testimony day, so I think we're good. It's going to be a long day. I think we're oh, going to hear from a lot, uh, city, from city agencies to major um, advocacy groups across the city, and um, we'll, hopefully we'll hear from some Manhattanites and New Yorkers. I know that the other day they were in the Bronx, they had a hearing in the Bronx, and that was a little bit contentious. Really, um, you think? I'm so I'm, I'm so <laughs> surprised. You mean Bronx people had something to say? Pointed. And so we'll see what Manhattanites have to say tonight, and and who knows who else might come from the other boroughs. So yeah, it'll right. be it'll be interesting. Well, the reason that we had originally called you and said we wanted you to have on the show because you had uh, written what I thought was a really interesting article, and the, and the headline was "Data Reveals Threats to Affordable Housing Across New York City Neighborhoods," and you pointed out places where a now, now there's a, we know development is pushing and pulling all over the place, especially in the borough of the Bronx, but you were saying there are neighborhoods where affordable housing and the availability of affordable housing is going down. So why don't we start from, from the bottom, you know, where did you find this information? And then let's talk specifically about why this might affect Bronx neighborhoods. Um, this is an annual um, data graphic that comes out from the Association for Neighborhood Housing and Development, and they've been doing it for quite a while. And it catalogs like the risk to affordable housing across all of the 59 uh, community districts in the city. And they have they look at factors from like overcrowding, eviction, foreclosure notices, uh, how many uh, residents are rent burdened, 
Um, and it really kind of gives you a little bit of, it gives you an interesting picture of how the affordability crisis is exhibiting itself um, in the borough and housing stock, by borough and um, housing stock. Mm -hmm. so, and, and the results uh, for the borough of the Bronx, I've got right in front of me, University Heights and Fordham, uh, which are home to yeah. the Jerome Avenue rezoning, facing, and this is literally your words, facing the highest threat to affordable housing. And then yeah. they all, you also quoted Mount Haven Melrose, Morrisania Cretona, Hybrid South Concourse, Belmont East Tremont, and Kingsbridge Heights Bedford. You're literally talking about the the guts of uh, the borough of the Bronx, aside from the north and uh, and east, sec northwest, north and east sections. Um, just tell me about, you know, cause and effect. Why are we in this situation? Um, it, after, well, kind of, it has to do a lot with um, how uh, rent burdened uh, growth of, like Bronx residents have been, and the number is just getting in higher and higher. For example, um, University Heights and Fordham neighborhoods in the Bronx have the highest number of residents who are rent burdened, which basically means that if you're paying more than 30% of your income towards rent, that means, you know, uh, for example, in University Heights and Fordham, it was uh, an estimated like 64%. Um, of tenants were paying more than 30% of their income towards their gross rent. Um, and that's, uh, that's overwhelming. Uh, the, for... uh, the numbers are striking and they're very difficult to um, accept. And also they lend credence to people who are very concerned that in this spate of development that we're getting, um, that they're being forced out. I mean, right. be, using that as a, as a measuring stick, it would be hard to deny their claim. Right. It would. And, um, you know, the 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 city has argued time and time again that they have a lot of programs in place to fight these. But we're not really seeing the effect of that. The danger already, uh, you know, a lot of housing and tenant advocates like CASA and NWCC are saying that the it, the crisis is happening right now. The effect is so immediate and urgent and that the city needs to take like more immediate action rather than something through policy and systematic where it'll eventually... Yeah, like um, legislative that'll you know, put up right, a bill, right? Right, so, so they... So, well, yeah. so let me ask you, what, what would that action be? What could that action be uh, um, that could take more immediate effect than having, you know, council members uh, draw up legislation and get the, you know, everybody to vote and have the mayor sign it and have a series of hearings? I mean, we know what that takes. Um, what, what could be done? Uh, in I, think, uh, I think I uh, think some of the the immediate, uh, for example, um, there's for evictions. I think there's a lot of um, uh, legal, free legal uh, services that are available that the city has expanded some of their funding towards, and hopefully um, they'll put in more money. That has shown that in the past. I, th I think we've discussed this before in the past where. We've seen that the numbers for um, evictions have become stagnant. They're steadying out. So that's, although the numbers are still high, mm. um, the fact that, you know, last year it was maybe like 100 less than this year. Yeah, might, but, you know, I, I, Sadef, I, just want to, I just want to interject about that. So I hear what you're saying about evictions, and, and I understand that, you know, that, that can be dealt with. But that's not, you know, that's almost like, after the fact, I mean, uh, right, my right. sense is, uh, you know, if, if the way things are going, those controls need to be put in place before development happens, rather than saying, well, let's keep you from being evicted, but that doesn't mean we've lowered your rent or helped you make more money or helped to balance the scales, right? Mm -hmm. I don't mean to ask a difficult question, but no, you know, no. I'm thinking about people who are saying, wait a minute, all right, so I'm not going to be evicted, but I still can't afford my rent. Right. And we're asking the and of course, this all comes down to what's going to happen in June. In June, um, uh, rent stabilization laws are set to expire, right. um, as well as uh, rent. Uh, the rent guideline board will be setting uh, on June 25th. We'll also be uh, voting on how much rent will be raised in the city. Mm -hmm. So June is a really important month to watch. Um, in Albany and in the city to what, how, how our politicians and our policymakers will be answering these questions for um, residents that are 
uh, overwhelmingly burdened with high rents, with evictions, um, living in bad conditions. And um, and we have a lot of strong voices from the Bronx that are Whoa, part of the push. Sure. A lot of uh, strong voices from the Bronx that are part of that major push. Uh, you and know, it will it will also be fascinating for pundits and journalists, you and me, to be watching in how the um, changed legislature in the state reacts. And, and they're actually, where did I see that article today? Um, I, 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 I don't want to quote another uh, publication, maybe Intelligence or somewhere, where it talk, <laughs> and kind of, could have even been in the Times, uh, that talked about kind of a split in the Democratic Party, not trusting um, the leadership, let's say, of Carl Hasty or other people saying that they've almost crossed to the other side. It will be very interesting to see, mm -hmm. how, you know, how strong they are on rent protections and if they're able to move things forward, as this, the state legislature has been able to do. Uh, you know, with the new alignment. Right. It's it's going to be a different ball game because we have a uh, very different Senate this year. And it'll be fascinating to see how um, uh, the politics play out. But I would be it would be more interesting to see if they follow through on the promises that they've made to their constituency. Well, and, and also what I guess their politics um, would would suggest and, um, uh, you know, now that you have the, it's almost like you've got the power, what are you going to do with it? This will be uh, the whole, I'm, I'm thrilled that you brought it up, this rent stabilization battle uh, that is coming up is going to be fascinating and interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, Absolutely. Sadef, you, um, you are just a wonderful guest, exactly what this program was designed to, uh, 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 to present, and uh, so we appreciate your time. Uh, we hope Great. you get a nice uh, uh, dinner and maybe a cup of coffee so you can uh, uh, last <laughs> through what you're about to witness. But we will look for you on City Limits and uh, what you report on this and other issues. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Gary. Great. Said F. Ali Cully from uh, City Limits, and um, she was downtown <laughs> and uh, on her way to do something um, that I'm glad she's going to do. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Let's take a short break. We're going to be back with Bronx filmmakers. Don't go away. Sure, I look cute now, but when my owner lost his job, it was rough. I was living on the street, and one night, me and this Cocker Spaniel got into it so bad, I wound up looking like an ice cream cone. I cried a little bit, but thankfully I got rescued, so I'm running, I'm jumping, all back to my old self, and I'm ready to give unconditional love, even if you put a lampshade on my head. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma too? Does that run in the family? This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Dad, we're not supposed to touch anything. Oh, sorry. Go along, son. It's always worth it. Whoa, master! The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. from Bebo's Do It Your Selfie, where we recreate the hottest looks from today's biggest music videos. After cleaning out our closet, we have a lot of clothes we don't wear anymore. Like this old t-shirt. It's not garbage, it's actually a brand new rug. And to make it, all you need to do is cut, tie, and glue. Cut the t-shirt into strips. Tie the strips into knots. And glue the knots to the bath mat. I love it. Give your garbage another life. And recycle.
Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz, and uh, we've got a couple of Bronx filmmakers in the house. And uh, so we'll say hello to Greg Hernandez, nice to have you with us, and Edwin Torres, nice to have you with us. You guys put out something called 1.5 million. Now, I'm guessing, just a guess, that this refers to the population in the Bronx. I don't know that we're at 1.5, but we're pretty close. Estimation, yes, correct. Tell me all about 1.5 million. So it is a documentary on the literacy crisis in the Bronx. I began working on it in 2017, but I had the idea in my head since 2014 because uh, I was working on a short film and I needed to find a bookstore in the Bronx. And that's, <laughs> when I, that's when I heard the Barnes & Noble was set to close, but it remained open for a couple of years. And then in 2017, I began researching, watching documentaries because I have a narrative background and uh, I'm on year three now. Well, there you go. Um, what gave you an indication that there is or there was a literacy crisis in the Bronx? Sure. Uh, I think coming back from college and walking around and seeing the lack of intellectual curiosity and visibility, you know, the Bronx is gifted with many, you know, great libraries, but in terms of uh, buying literature, purchasing liter literature, that's a commodity that you don't really see in the Bronx as much, mm -hmm. um, but now we just got back our only independent bookstore. Although I guess, and I'm sure the numbers exist somewhere, is that you could go find out what people are buying online, because if there wasn't a bookstore, that doesn't mean nobody in the Bronx was buying books. I mean, you weren't buying it from a, you know, a brick and mortar store. Store, but you could have been, I mean, we, I buy, bought books online and put them on the Kindle and everything else. Um, do we have an indication about that, or that's a, kind of a, another uh, thought about uh, literacy and how people in the Bronx are consuming it? Well, we have a vibrant library uh, system in the Bronx. Many people go to their libraries, but in terms of purchasing literature, yeah, it, it is mostly online. In terms of brick and mortar, we don't have that. Now right. we, now we have we the lit bar. Now we right, have the right, one right, we just right, got right. back uh, almost two weeks ago. Right. But uh, most people would go out of their way to go up north, Westchester, Scarsdale, or into Manhattan to purchase a uh, book. Right. So it's really great now that we'll have a small business, such as a bookstore, in our borough, because small businesses have a great effect on their local communities. Uh, Edwin, talk to me about um, uh, the notion of film and how this relates to film and what this is all about. Uh, well, basically, I found this project on Instagram, and I messaged uh -huh. him directly, uh, and I we were just. He said, "Wait a minute, the Bronx films? Exactly. Who, who, who knew me here? Yeah. Who, right. Who knew my name? Yeah, it's crazy. It's like so, another Bronx filmmaker trying to make something big, you know, a big project about about our borough. So I wanted to join him on that. And ever since then, like we just started emailing each other. And then Go, goes back the same three years he was talking about. No, no. So this was earlier in January. Oh, so, so I wasn't on for the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but what I find is fascinating, and, and I got to tell you, you're not the only two people in the Bronx who have thought about these things in a very dramatic way. So in in your mind, independently, you were saying, "Hey, this is a crisis, or this is something I want to tune into." Yeah, I mean, and then, I then was a the, too. <laughs> the yeah. match was made, so to speak. The chemical reaction happened. Is that, so that is true. Yeah, yeah. We just like this guy's trying to do something. He's because I I've lived here all my life and I've seen this problem develop as well. I I had fond memories at that Barnes and Noble and then when it closed, I didn't have anything left. So and that actually just that, that actually was a really good story because mm, aside yeah. from they had Bronx, I mean I'm always interested in Bronx books. They had a Bronx section and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there, but there was a lot of stuff in there. There was stuff happening, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it be, you know, we, we'd get the book signings or whatever. I, I loved. I have to tell you, I did love that store. Um, so you had mentioned before the show you're from Norwood. Yeah. Um, talk to me about your interest in film. How did you get into? Uh, it? I mean, I basically just was raised in front of a television and just watched <laughs> TV all the Name time. Name somebody around here who wasn't. Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to be a part of it. So I, you know, I actually I went to this Saturday program called uh, Stage Kids in uh, Masha Montefiore Community Center, Beacon. And I just did that every Saturday. And then I uh, did this other program called Teen to Teen when I got a little older. And that was also part of MMCC. And right. then I did a little practice with uh, TV broadcasting. And then I went to college in School of Visual Arts for film and video mm -hmm. and graduated and So one thing led to the other. You know, the, there's yeah. a lot of uh, intrigue in there about in terms of Bronx youth and what affects them. And for folks who know, Marshall and Montefiore Community Center is you know, a wonderful, amazing organization. I went to day camp there. My kids yeah. went to day camp there. And we played Little League and all that kind of stuff. But this kind of thing being inspired through a program like that is, it happens, but we don't hear it often enough. I'm assuming you agree with, uh, with what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know anybody that came from uh, MMCC background, so... 
Yeah. Right, and, and, and so um, uh, here you are uh, making films as a result of the inspiration you got. Boy, it, I, I, it's one of my main advocacies is uh, reinforcing our community centers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's we say, actually had a networking event there last month. Oh, uh, there you go, for this? Oh, yeah. For, for filmmakers, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, Greg, talk to me about your background in film. Where, yeah, where, sure. When did you get into it? What's your interest? Sure, I had a roundabout way of getting into film. I studied theater and creative writing at Binghamton University. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of my friends started a Binghamton film initiative so that's when I got to start working in front of the camera my acting background to now working behind the camera as an assistant director mm -hmm. and then one of my friends got me on a feature film so I started working and freelancing in the uh, film and television industry uh -huh. and I started writing my own work what, what do you love about it about films I love the collaborative process because you can't do it alone you theoretically can make a film on your own but and, and more so nowadays than you used yeah. to because yeah. of the available technology it's everything's cheaper you can rent equipment you don't have to worry as much about insurance but I really love working with people from pre-production to, to production to post to make it happen um, so um, do we want to we want to show a little uh, sure. clip of what you've done yeah. so um, let's show your work, and then I, what I want to talk about is the whole notion of a film challenge and a film collective, sure. because that, um, in part, is what uh, they came here to talk about. So we have a clip from um, uh, just a piece you had done, I guess, interviewing people about the same issue we've been talking about. Uh, do you want to give it a title? Give it. We're going to show us about a minute clip so of it. So it's a work sample based off of the footage we have so far um, on our documentary, which once again focuses on literacy in the Bronx. Does it have a name? Of the oh no, not, uh, the, the documentary is 1.5 million. Oh, that's it. That's okay, it. now I got. It. I'm, I'm slow on the uptake. Right. All right. So here we go. Um, uh, there's no 1.5 million. There's no other name for the team or anything like that. By uh, Greg and Edwin, and also uh, Arius uh, Productions. Oh, Adios Perez, who's another filmmaker from the Bronx, Norwood. Yeah. There you go. Say, All right, let's, uh, let's take a look. That's it. This is an opportunity to create new firsts for literacy in the Bronx. The opening of the Lit Bar for the Bronx means that we have our first independent bookstore. It is truly ours. It belongs to the community. We know that we are welcome. The Lit Bar opening in the Bronx would be a new chapter for black entrepreneurship in the Bronx. It's a way for Bronxites to feel good about buying books from a black owned, female owned um, company and they can really feel good about their purchases that they're giving back to their community and that they are buying diverse books straight from the source. The lip bar means hope for the Bronx. Noelle is a Bronxite. To see one of our own taking this opportunity and bringing that, bringing that new space is inspiring. I also hope that when the lip bar opens and any other independent bookstores that may open in the Bronx, that we vote with our wallets mm. and we patronize these businesses, spend money, linger, then that will say, well, this is making profit, this is doing well. Um, it's important to nurture what we do receive. All right, we'll give a little applause with a little uh, snippet, um, certainly about the subject matter. It can't have been difficult to find people who wanted to talk about those items in the Bronx because everybody's been talking about it. Yeah. And, we, and we should mention that was previous to when the, the, the store opened because it did open uh, very recently. Yeah, a lot of that footage is from 2018. Yeah. Ah, there we go. So um, talk to me about uh, like what that is the beginning of. Oh, the documentary? Yes. Um, well. Right now it's going to be a short documentary, it might turn into a feature length, but mm -hmm. what we want to showcase is basically one thing. Barnes & Noble left in 2016. What are Bronxites, what have Bronxites done since its departure to really increase and make a rope, create a robust uh, literary ecosystem in the borough? And, and I understand there, um, there was just announced uh, in, uh, yesterday or the day before that there's going to be a mobile bookstore in Bronx the Bronx. Bronxbound Books. Yeah. Bronxbound Books. And so um, it seems a little less further on than, than obviously the Lit Bar is, but we'll all watch that. To me, it's like a little energy uh, beginning. Edwin, talk to me about um, this um, film challenge and the film collective that you guys are putting together. Uh, well, the uh, the challenge is something we both came up with. We were, we had a you know one of our meetings. We uh, we basically wanted a way to uh, increase our network and other with other filmmakers in the Bronx. 
So we had a couple of filmmaking networking events to you know kind of gather more people and meet more people. But now it's to really just showcase like what these you know how passionate these people are in this borough. So we really just want to not only like network with other people, but showcase that there are other, other stories to tell and that they can do it in 48 hours. And and so what? Is, let's be specific. What is the, what is the challenge, and what are we asking them to do? Uh, basically, we're having them like so. You have a, you're gonna assemble a team, and you're gonna have you know uh, you have to film it in the Bronx. So you have to you in know, 48 hours. In 48 hours, yes. So we have this you know this coming weekend to. Uh, Gather your team, secure locations, and your yeah, actors. This coming, we want to get the dates right. So this coming weekend, I'm thinking, is the 11th and 12th. Yeah. Right? So you're going to get your team together, and then what happens after that? And then they're going to come to the Bronx Documentary Center, where we're going to debrief them on the rules and what they have when, to do. When is that? So that's going to be on May 10th. That's going to be on Friday from oh, 5 tomorrow. to 7. Wow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so, so they come to the Bronx Documentary Center at what time? Yeah, so at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, yeah. and then uh, when do they go out and make the film? So the 48 hours actually starts at 7 p.m. So as soon as 7 p.m. hits, everybody wants on to... On Friday night? On Friday night, yeah. Everybody wants to get out of there and start planning for the movie. And then what happens then? So let's say there's 5, 10, 20, I don't know how many entries you'll have. Then they're going to be judged, and then at some point we're going to have the winner of the 48-hour film. Film. Yeah, we have. What we, a fascinating thing. Yeah, we have you, uh, judges. Uh, yeah, uh, we are working with our Bronx Film Collective and a few other people to look at the, uh, look at the films and judge them accordingly. Mm -hmm. Do you, go ahead, do you have a sense of, of who's going to apply and who's going to be part of it? Or um, at this point, do we know that there are filmmakers? Sure. Uh, we're in beta mode, so we wanted to do this for the first time and obviously make it better. Uh, we sold out our tickets on Eventbrite, so Whoa. we sold out 60 tickets. 6-0? So 6, zero. six zero. Oh, giddy up. So, I love that. Yeah. So, I, I was thinking, gee, if you get five, we'll be happy. Exactly. That's where yeah. our expectations were. We're like, wow, this is doing really well. And we luckily have great partners. And through the BDCC. I Bronx mean, those, Documentary Center. Right. Those guys put that. Um, wow. So we have three judges, one from the Bronx Documentary Center, one from the Bronx Filmmakers Collective, and one from Fordham University. And, and so they'll judge, and then when do you announce the winners, or just right away yeah. Sunday night? No, well, we not if you get 60 we, entries. Although, actually, 60 is is because, you you know, there are probably teams of exactly. people. Yeah. Around. We're going to have a screening the following month, most likely at the Bronx Documentaries, doc, Documentary Center on June 15th, um, and that's where we'll announce the winners in a screen festi screening festival. I would love to feature. We sure. want to bring the winners up onto the show. We want to even show some of the others. Uh, we can, well, we'll talk to our producer, Steve Powell, about putting together you know, let's bring a, the first, second, and third. We can feature everybody on there. That's Sounds exactly awesome. what this show is. Uh, listen, you guys are um, just fantastic. Um, and then you're going to just keep working on the documentary? Yes. Sounds to me like, and I'm going to make an assumption, the documentary is almost an aside. The fil This 48-hour thing, what a tremendous concept. I, for yeah. us, um, it's the other All way right, around. Tell me, I got to wrap up. Say it sure, real quick. Sure. Other way around, because All as right. a filmmaker, you want to be an entrepreneur. So, Greg, Greg yeah. Hernandez, Edwin Torres. You. These are Bronx boys doing All the right. right thing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us, folks. Uh, we will see you uh, next week on the Bronx Buzz Monday night. It's Iran Barkley on Bronx Talk.